It is full time at Eden Park and the 30 year unbeaten record stays intact for the All Blacks. Hello amateurs and welcome back to the channel here with you throughout the summer series and beyond to hit subscribe down below to make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes. Now then, New Zealand have won but for lengthy periods in this game England dominated territory and possession and it looked like they were the more likely victors but that's not how it panned out. Let's get into it. Some of the themes from the first half were New Zealand scrum dominance, really dominant in the scrum winning penalties. But England just stole a ton of New Zealand lineouts. As good as New Zealand were in the scrum, they were abject in the lineout. Another theme from the first half was England with a lot of creative kicking, lots of different types of kicking, and we'll dig into some of those as we go through. But this game got off to an absolutely wild start as Chandler Cunningham South got ended by Coley Taylor, which uh, led to an incredible counter rock by New Zealand, which we saw a lot of last week. Freddie Stewart was in trouble at the back. He got scragged and there was another counter ruck, but the counter ruck went so far past the ball that it left England to pick it up and charge upfield, almost creating a chance themselves. All of this in the opening 90 seconds. Uh, sadly, the game didn't carry on in that theme throughout, but wow, what a start. Freddie Stewart was really prominent in good ways and bad at the start of this game because he dropped the next kick that New Zealand put up. And New Zealand almost scored from that. Damian McKenzie chipping over, uh, putting somebody through a gap, but then the ball just got knocked down in the last pass. And New Zealand just looked so, so dangerous. Every time there was a, just a little break in play, Damian McKenzie at the centre of everything, just understanding where the space is and putting people in holes. But this was where England's kicking started to come in. They had a box kick set up in their 22 uh, and they went for a miss one wiper, old old school, uh, just something different, just to change the picture, just to uh, make a different uh, kind of thing for New Zealand to look at with Freddie Stewart again, as I said, very active early doors with the kick. The first few scrums, New Zealand have been nudging, been nudging, and a couple of them collapsed. And I think the referee was looking at these going, right, I can't really call that one, but eventually I think it was the third scrum of the game. Stewart went down, uh, led to a penalty, and this was a, a big problem for England in the first half. On 11 minutes, the opening try, and it came from our man, uh, Mark Talea. But it started with a tap-free kick routine, something you don't typically see. From 20 metres out, Adi Salvea carrying the ball up twice, but the first one, where he absolutely bashed through uh, Sam Underhill, England's best tacker, tackler, maybe the world's best tackler. Uh, he got through an incredible leg drive from Surveyor and ended up with a ruck right on the left-hand touchline. Well, about five metres in from the left-hand touchline, Itoji was working across to it, thought he had a chance to steal, so went in. He got cleared out. Talea was left with the ball to just walk down the sideline with a really good finish, actually. I think it was Marcus Smith getting across to try and tackle him into touch, but he just got in there to score. That decision by Itoji, it's a tough one. If he really thought he had a chance to steal the ball, then you know dealing with it in that moment is a good thing. But it meant that there was nobody there on the blind side for Talea, uh, to mark up Talea. England, though, hit back almost immediately. They did a, a set play from a line-out, got Ben Earl charging through the middle and then moved it left again, where Freeman caught the ball and just battered over Stephen Perifetta, who'd come up to close the door. Back to Marcus Smith, Next, next, very next phase, and he did a beautiful crossfield kick where Faye Waboso was in acres of space to step inside Damian McKenzie to score for 7 7. And again, at this point, the game was just wild. There was lots going on, both teams really attacking. Um, and yeah, it was, it was absolutely thrilling. England's kicking, though, wasn't always great. As I said, there was lots of variety. Uh, but they didn't always come off. Shortly after that, Marcus Smith hit a crossfield sort of bomb again. But it was Maritoji and Ben Earl, you know, not the worst defenders, but they had Damian McKenzie and I think two or three other backs in that area as well, which meant it was a massive advantage for New Zealand if they can get a clean catch, which they did. Damian McKenzie spotted the hole between, between Atoji and Earl, went clean through, and it looked like New Zealand had to score. I mean, I really think they should have scored Perifeta, Talea, the sort of basketball passes back between each other. I honestly think if Talea had just bitten down and gone for it, then he would have scored. But Freddie Stewart got across. Brilliant defensive play by, by him. 
So Talea tried to get it back inside and Marcus Smith worked so hard after the dodgy kick to get back and intercept. But that led to another scrum penalty. Again, for New Zealand, they really got the nodge on, particularly early in this game, which uh, led to 10-7. England, kicking, ingenuity, had did a, uh, a, a deep kickoff, a really quick kickoff, which we saw Scotland do a lot against uh, in the Six Nations, successfully against England. So England got deep down into New Zealand territory. They managed to turn over that line out by sacking it and got a scrum from that and the scrum now was improving England would manage to hold their own they were not buckling under pressure and um, this led to a poor exit from New Zealand New Zealand were trying to milk a penalty they were trying not milk a penalty they were trying to earn a penalty and uh, they didn't get it and it led to a poor kick um, and England attacked from there and and looked pretty fluent in attack not their absolute best but not bad either you know they're working through a lot of phases but People were just on roller skates through this portion of the game. It's classic kind of New Zealand evening. It looked really greasy out there and people were slipping and sliding all over the place. Freddie Stewart caught the ball and fell over. Somebody, I think it was Geordie Barrett, slipped over just before he was making a tackle. Um, and yeah, it was it was a bit of a mess during this part of the game. But these scrum issues would continue. And this one's a bit more of a subtle one. England had a scrum, really good attacking position kind of centre of the pitch, around about the 22, and they did manage to lock it out. They locked out this scrum, it's their ball, but the ball is stuck in the second row. And you're looking at it going, well, somebody just picked their foot up and, and nudged that ball back. But if one of those second rows moves their feet when the scrum is that locked out, then the whole thing can go. Ben Earl at number eight, he can't get that ball through the second row's feet, so he's got to pick it up from inside the second row. That allowed Finley Christie to, to sack him basically at the back of the ruck, at uh, the back of the scrum, and it turned into New Zealand ball. And that's part of the game. Like it's a really fine margin there. England had to lock the scrum out. Could Ben Earl have taken more time maybe to get the ball around to a more advantageous position? Possibly. Uh, is that an experience for him in the number eight slot? Possibly. But it led to a turnover for New Zealand. Another issue for England during this first half was penalties. There were on the bad side of the penalty count and penalties by Ben Earl and Atoji led to another kickable penalty in 13-7 and at this point it looked like even though England had done lots of good and New Zealand looked really dangerous the first half was very even it looked like New Zealand were just stretching away going into half time but England did get possession back just before the break and a penalty advantage came Marcus Smith went for a bit more of a gamble crossfield kick this time but it was only a gamble if you didn't have Tommy Freeman charging onto it because he got up so early above Mark Talea and caught the ball high above his head to score the try converted by Smith and it was 13-14 to England at half time and it felt like this game was just going to take off like a rocket ship in the second half some themes from the first half. New Zealand were attacking. Their attacking shape was really narrow, which meant sometimes England's defence was about as narrow and as aggressive as I've ever seen it. There was times when right wing Faya Waboso was only about 20 metres from an open side ruck. Um, but England worked. It did work for England the majority of the time, catching New Zealand behind the gain line of forcing errors. England, though, couldn't really get into their th flow a little bit. Ollie Lawrence dropped a couple of balls. The penalty count... And there was not a lot of play in the middle third. Both teams choosing to be more pragmatic this week, I'd say, than last week. And that's exactly how the second half started. There was a lot of kicking at the start of the second half, a lot of trying to force uh, pressure. The kicking wasn't all that accurate during this phase either. And again, Ben Earl and Ollie Lawrence, their little combination because they, they link up a lot off the back of um, line out, drive and, and then pop out. It wasn't quite working, whether it was the timing. There was definitely one Ben Earl pass early in the second half, which was up by Ollie Lawrence's shoulder, which is not where you want to be taking it when you're carrying into traffic. But it just wasn't flowing for England in that respect. But they did get a break shortly afterwards from a line-out play. Dalton Papialiti was a judge to have taken out um, Henry Slade, which, oh, on reflection, was a marginal call for me. This it, New Zealand were doing this all game and Jamie George was in the referee's ear all game about it but this one for me looked a little bit dodgy I think 
there was contact, but I think Slade got taken out by the tackler who tackled Marcus Smith uh, rather than Papi Aliti. Anyway, that was all mistimed that Smith was carrying it into contact because it was Chandler Cunningham himself who took the line out. And New Zealand did a beautiful little bit of play. They just got hold of his in inside arm as he was coming down and looking to deliver the ball. That little delay caused everything to be a little bit further forward in the midfield and Smith carrying the ball in. Lovely bit of play by New Zealand there. The benches started to get open now. Tom Curry, Theo Dan and Dan Cole onto the pitch. 115 caps, Dan Cole. Second in the caps list now for England men's rugby team. And Theo Dan celebrated by getting himself injured almost immediately. Getting his head on the wrong side of the wrong person in Patrick Tuopoloto. It looked like a little a nasty one at first, but he got up and was fine to walk off, but didn't return. So Jamie George... And you'd want this as a front rower. He was only off the pitch for about a minute, maybe two. So he didn't have any time to cool down straight back into it. England, though, were just dominating territory during this position, this, this phase of the game. It turned into an arm wrestle it, again, as it did last week. And England weren't trying to play at all in the middle third. And even when they were getting towards a 22, they were still chipping through a lot and just trying to pressure, pressure, pressure New Zealand. And it was working. It was really working. England looked so dominant through, excuse me, these phases of the game. It led to Sever Reese carrying the ball back into his 22 and then kicking out on the full. There was a knock-on in the tack tackle from that play by Mark Talea. So England had gone nicely through the middle of the pitch here. Got to an edge. Talea came in to make the tackle and the referee called it a knock-on. I'm very happy with that decision. Make your decision. Call it. We don't need to go to the TMO for all of these things. England ended up with a free kick. And this is one of the law changes. Almost certainly it happened with New Zealand in the first half in England here. These would have been called as scrums in these positions on the pitch. But England tapped and went with Ben Earl. And they played one phase. And Marcus Smith from within the New Zealand half managed to kick into the New Zealand corner about five metres out. This was really poor from Mark Talea to leave that space. He should have been back covering that. Um, it was, yeah, I mean, brilliant by Smith to spot it and, and kick it in there, but Mark Talea really should have had that covered. England messed it up, though. The referee was clear. The five-metre line is the middle of the line out, and that is standard. For all of these lineouts, uh, deep in territory, it's been that way since I was playing. All referees use that um, terminology, and it was Dan Cole. Well, it's Dan Cole at the front of the lineup. But I think all of England was stood on the five metre line. New Zealand lineout was had been terrible. Still into the second half, England have got them five metres from their own line, and they give away a dumb free kick like that. It was really frustrating for England. Um, and then their line-out started to go awry. Uh, it was Jamie George. I don't know whether, like, when you're taken off, maybe you mentally switch off a little bit. But he threw a couple of low ones, one of which was low enough that Ardi Savea managed to get up and win it. And this led to New Zealand getting territory for the first time in the second half. And it felt like the crowd had just been holding its breath all this time. And then suddenly they got some territory and on the back of it played some great rugby as well. They moved the ball to space. England looking like they were hanging on, but the way they defend, they always look like they're hanging on. You know, unless they get that dominant hit early, you know, they can look like they're hanging on. So I wasn't too concerned. What I was concerned about was that Mitchell was not kicking the ball off the pitch from box kicks. He did it once or twice in the first half and he neither needed to kick them high enough and short enough for them to compete, which they did a couple of times in the first half as well. So it wasn't everyone. Tommy Freeman won a ball in the air in the first half. But with New Zealand's line-out being really, really dodgy, then you either get it off the pitch and try and win the ball back, or you kick it high enough that you can compete. Mitchell kicked one that was too long, and it just gave New Zealand perfect counter-attack opportunity what they want it's exactly what they want tactically it's exactly what they want for their emotional energy as well and for the crowd and they counter-attacked beautifully from one of these plays it got through a few phases Bowden Barrett uh picked out and uh Mark Talea to scythe through for 18-17 and England were aggressive on the defense Finn Baxter charged up to try and make the hit this is what they do you may look at it and go, they're shorthanded, they should have drifted, but that's not England's style. England's style is to come up and then it's the other players to come round and try and cut off that. England didn't have the scramble defence in place for this uh, try by New Zealand, which was beautifully taken. 
Bowden Barrett being the key factor in this one. Finsmith came on for Marcus Smith around 63 minutes, I think it was. And England continued to chip through. This must have been a deliberate tactical ploy that they'd identified. And you don't know the the other side of it, right? So that none of these chips seemed to pay off for England. Bowden Barrett at the back was dealing with them superbly. In particular, one pickup of the bootlaces and then cleared up to the halfway line. However, I'm assuming England were doing this. Well, they did it last week as well, but they were doing it because they know that after they get through a certain number of phases, if they aren't going forward, then the chances are New, New Zealand are going to turn them over or win a penalty at the breakdown. Oh, I don't know. It's a tough situation, but they weren't benefiting th- from the chip throughs. Maybe they needed to be angled more towards the corner. Maybe with New Zealand's faltering line out, they might have just been happy to get them off the pitch. I don't know, but it wasn't working for England. And they were again on the ropes shortly afterwards. Maru Toji giving a penalty away in front of the sticks pretty much for 21-17. Straight from the kickoff, Maru Toji gives another penalty away for a high tackle, which just it's just an easy exit for New Zealand. 21-17, absolutely still in the game with sort of, I think about 10 minutes to go at that stage. You just want the ball back in New Zealand's half, make it difficult for them to get out. And it was just... Oh, frustrating for England. Bevan Rod was on the pitch at this point and he'd had a brilliant counter ruck against his opposite number, actually. Fletcher Newell driving him back over the ruck in an incident that was almost exactly the same as the one that got TJ Perinara injured last week. This led to a scrum, but Newell got his revenge. When I first saw Fletcher Newell on the international stage, I was not impressed that New Zealand's scrum got taken apart, but that was by South Africa. He is certainly showing his worth now and this was a hugely dominant scrum by him literally going through Bevan Rod. It would have probably ended up being a a tight head win for the New Zealand scrum but the referee gave a penalty anyway. That led to a line out. New Zealand kicked into the... uh, (laughs) Sorry. New Zealand kicked that penalty into the corner for a line out and that man again, Marutoji, gave away another penalty. I don't know what his personal penalty count was in this game but it was far too high. This is the gamble with Mero. He is so competitive. He gets away with things because he's on the line all the time. He he sort of makes play happen because he's on that borderline. When he's over that borderline, he gives away, I don't know, it was at least five penalties, I think, in this game, possibly more. That led to, uh, yeah, and it was kickable. So 24-17, now England is seven points down. Three minutes to go and, you know, really, you know, they hope to score quickly and then have a chance to win the game. But they're still chipping the ball through. Again, it must be a tactical thing where they've got this stats-based analysis where they think that if they just carry on playing, they're going to get turned over anyway. So, you know, just play a few phases and if you're not going forward, then then kick it through. But it just led to more time off the clock. Again, New Zealand dealing with these kicks absolutely superbly. They're really good at it. There was still time, though, for Oli Slytome on to absolutely skin Severo Reese on the outside. I don't think Severo Reese will ever give him that much time again. Probably no other winger in world rugby now. They haven't done their homework on Oli Slytome. Tom Curry got whacked off the ball uh, when he was going in to clear a ruck. Again, this was mentioned in the first half. It does happen. You know, it's fair enough. You know, it's part of the game. You know, you need to sort of account for these people in the defensive line. But it did happen a lot. And it gave England a chance with a penalty. They got a five-metre line out. And I just thought, you've got to go for a drive here. You've got to go for a drive. And Benel came out and tried to, I think they were trying to trying to run it through the midfield or something, but Benel carried it another phase and New Zealand won the turnover. And that felt like game over, except for the fact that Marcus Smith found a quick counter-attack from a quick line-out, got New Zealand offside, and England got another chance at a five-metre line-out. This time they did go for the drive. They got it set quite nicely as well, but New Zealand defended really well as well and got the ball sort of shifting backwards, sideways. At this point, Ollie Lawrence had joined the mall. Jamie George had the ball in his hands. Lawrence and George broke off. George then got tackled by Geordie Barrett, just short of the line and dragged him over the line for held up. It felt to me like that was game over, but then the TMO got involved because there was a lot of very, very tight calls in this phase of play. Firstly, did Lawrence and George break off from the mall? And therefore, it was obstruction by Lawrence. And if if that was fine, then was it a, a collapse mall by Geordie Barrett and therefore potentially a penalty try? 
And for me, this was so, so tight. I think that Jamie George and Lawrence were still bound to the original mall when the other New Zealand player came in. Although New Zealand had defended that mall very well, so it did very much look like Lawrence and George had sort of slipped off the side and dis- uh, and unbound. I'm not unhappy with this decision. I think it could it absolutely made sense the way Nick Berry described it. However, I could see it, another referee describing it a different way as well, which just is the grey in rugby laws that is very difficult to adjudicate. I don't think it made an, any difference in this respect because I think that... Geordie Barrett legally tackled Jamie George because he'd broken away from Lawrence. Therefore, the mall was over and it was it was he was legal to make a tackle anyway. So I don't think it made any difference to the end of the game. New Zealand won 24-17. I thought for them, I'd say Surveyor was pretty immense with some huge ca- carrying, tackling, a line-out steal, which you almost never see. I thought Bowden Barrett, when he came on, again, aside from one error, I think he had one, one little error, changed the game. Well, not necessarily changed the game, but the game changed when he came on. He was certainly excellent when he came onto the pitch. And the All Blacks, All Blacks were dominated, but they were really disciplined. And you've seen this from New Zealand teams over the years. You've seen South Africa absolutely batter New Zealand, but when they get the chance to win the game, they go and do it. And that's exactly what happened in this game in lots of ways. I thought this was a classic New Zealand performance and they absolutely deserved the win. For England, I thought Finn Baxter had another fine game carrying and tackling. Along with England scrum struggled, but I thought he did okay on his side. I thought George Martin was a really aggressive and, and you know heavy carries, heavy tackles again. And Manny Feo Waboso on the wing looked dangerous every time he got the ball. And also, when New Zealand got around the outside on his side, he's so quick to turn and get back and make the tackle. So, England will be devastated. Discipline was a major problem in this game. And I'll just, I'd like them to trust their attack a little bit more. Like, I respect the stats. I respect all that kind of stuff that goes into the analysis of the, how far they get through a phase count and all this kind of stuff. But... I just want to see them trust their attack. I think if they're going to develop their attack and get better at it, they need to have some fails along the way. And I'm happy for them to do that. It felt like an even bigger chance for England to win this game, probably than last week, I think. As the game went on, they looked so dominant when they got towards the final quarter. But it was not to be. And strangely, as New Zealand really struggled with their lineup, particularly through the first half, it was two poor lineouts from England that, gave New Zealand, New Zealand the opportunity to get back in the game. That's it, done. Eden Park, the record goes on. Anyway, that's what I think. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below and I'll join you there for a friendly conversation. Give this video a thumbs up while you're down there if you don't mind. And you can subscribe there. You can watch that one next. And do not forget to get out and play.